Welcome to the Tactical Historian. I'm Paul, the self-proclaimed Tactical Historian, and I'm with Terry Buckler and Cliff Westbrook, and we will be discussing one of the most daring raids in military history, the Sante Raid. So thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to be here. Our pleasure. So can you sort of introduce yourselves and explain how each of you are connected to the raid? Okay. Go for it, Cliff. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll start. Um, I had the pleasure in the preparation for the 50th anniversary of the Sante Raid to meet a lot of the raiders. Uh, my father was one of them. He was a pilot, a captain at the time on a C-130 that was chosen to be involved in the raid. He was on the aircraft called call sign Lime Zero Two. And that's one of the tankers that led the formation of six helicopters. And inside one of those six helicopters was Terry Buckler. So we are connected through that moment. And uh, it was only in the process of about a year prior to the 50th anniversary, which was this past November, that Terry and I met. Um, I found out that he was interested, was writing a book and had been working on it for years. And then all of a sudden, here comes, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity for me to be um, a little bit of a help writing that story. And it turned out that there were a lot of others that would be willing to tell their stories. So much like you, um, I found myself uh, maybe as an opportunity, as a as a, a, a conduit to tell a, quite a few stories. Terry's being the main one that carries the thread in our book. Here, I'll hold it up here. So this is what brought Terry and me together. And together we wrote this book and we included 40 stories, or I should say stories told by 40 of the participants in the Sante Raid. I was the youngest Sante Raider. I was 20 at the time. And I want to I want to uh, make a little change to what Cliff said. He said he helped a little uh, in writing the book. He helped a lot. So uh, I, I owe him a lot of uh, kudos for pushing me and making me do some of the things that I'm not a writer. But uh, with his help, uh, I think we came out with a pretty good uh, story. And uh, the people that have read it have voice their opinions and so far we've not had too many people throw rotten eggs at us That's they right. all seem to like it so uh, uh and i have to again say that cliff was a, a vital part of making that happen but uh, as far as my uh part of the raid uh i was volunteered for it like all the other gentlemen on the raid and uh, i had never been in combat before so it was a real opening a way to get initiated and uh, uh, I've never regretted it. I've worked with some fantastic warriors and uh, through their coaching, mentoring and uh, looking after my butt, uh, things came out in good shape. So uh, I feel like uh, the Sante Raid, uh, not only was it uh, history, but it was uh, for the Raiders, but it was history for the nation uh, to show that we do not leave men behind, although Afghanistan is starting to make a liar out of us. But uh, that's neither here nor there nor the raid. Uh, we have to do, we can't go on doing things like that. So uh, we went after the POWs knowing the uh, the fact that Bull told us we had a 50-50 chance of not making it back uh, before we boarded the plane stuck in our minds, I'm sure. But at the same time, we were all committed to the mission and to getting our POWs home. You just described a little bit about uh, the, the aims of the mission, the goal of the operation. Uh, let's pick up right there. Can you talk about sort of the situation on the ground in Vietnam that sort of gave rise to the idea of conducting this raid or or planted the seed if you will of conducting this operation terry would you mind if i start with yeah. that go go for it in may of 1970 
SR-71 imagery revealed that there were POWs in a location that had never been heard of before. It's in a small town called Sante, 23 miles to the west of Hanoi. And these uh, POWs were making signals, namely, and I've, I've had some of the POWs describe exactly what they were uh, drawing out, but they would arrange laundry to say POW and other symbols of uh, rescue, used in rescues. And so at the Pentagon, when they were reviewing, it's actually, uh, you know, uh, SR-71 Intel squadron in the DC area, uh, brought that to the attention of General Blackburn. Uh, and it rose to a level to be able to uh, create a study, a feasibility study that would uh, involve 15 uh, officers that were planners in the Pentagon. This was in the Deputy Chief of Staff of uh, Plans, um, and they uh, conducted over the that period, May, June, and up to July 1st, um, a study of whether it was possible to uh, plan a raid that would get those POWs out. This was maybe the first time that a, a POW camp was identified that had any chance of us getting into. You, you, everyone's heard of the Hanoi Hilton, but that's literally, literally right downtown. And there'd just be no hope of getting into that uh, with any success. But this one, it being... And they moved it over to Arlington Hall, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency, get it out of the Pentagon where there might be leaks, you know. So over in the DIA, they found, they believed a way that you could get in. And it was going to involve uh, special forces, Army Green Berets, actually going in, kicking down the doors, picking up the POWs, getting them on helicopters and getting out of there. And so by July 1st, they were able to uh, present that plan to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which was Thomas Moore, Admiral Thomas Moore, who enthusiastically supported it. Um, and uh, everybody knew of the torture of POWs by that point, and they knew that we had to do something. This was something that they saw. This could actually work. And so it had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff taking direct uh, supervision of it. And, and that would be the only place you could because all the resources would involve Air Force, Army, and Navy, as you'll see later on. And the only place where those would come together, back then there was no Special Operations Command, the only place where it comes together is at the very top, and that's the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Staff. Barry, just going forward and talking about this, can you talk a little bit about the training and the planning that went involved for uh, men like you who are involved in this raid? Yeah, the uh, training, we initially, the call went out on Smoke Bomb Hill, which is uh, home of the Green Beret there at Fort Bragg, that Bull Simon was looking for volunteers for a mission. And uh, uh, it was down in what we call at that time the Little White House. And uh, when we got down there to hear what Colonel Simons had to say, there was about 500 Special Forces guys. Uh, that wanted to, anybody knows Bull Simons, knows he's kind of an icon within Special Forces. So he, he uh, was looking for volunteers and he had over 500 volunteered. And out of that, uh, the selection process went through and they narrowed it down to 109. And out of the 109, 56 actually went on the, on the ground for that. And uh, the training was, um, we started out just, you know, doing basic training, you know, kind of for everybody reviewing their MOS, uh, military occupation. And uh, we did that for probably a week or two, doing the physical, making sure everybody was physically fit as well. And then uh, we started doing uh, uh, the advanced party, which I was a part of, we set up a mock uh, of the compound, of the POW compound. And at the time we had no idea what we were doing. It was uh, 
we were using target cloth and two by fours in the sand. And uh, to us, it uh, looked like toilet paper wrapped on two by fours, but uh, it was a, a very good uh, representation of what the compound itself would look like. And uh, so we started doing walkthroughs. And as we did that, uh, things always changed. So uh, they were fine tuning it. And we went from walkthroughs to running through it and then the live ammo. And so we trained uh, that away. And uh, uh, we trained that way in the daylight for probably about a month and getting it all down. And then we added the choppers and we also started training at night. And we did uh, the same thing, you know, how did you get off the chopper? What sequence? Within each of the uh, elements, the red wine, green leaf, and blue boy, there were three choppers that were basically the element of the Sante raid. Blue boy was uh, crashed inside the compound and that was done for purposes to protect the POWs. The planners, and the planners were, did a fantastic job on this. They estimated, they, they didn't know if the POWs would be uh, neutralized immediately if, if there was an escape uh, tried. So they said we had to have control of the guards inside the compound within a minute of getting down on the ground in the crash landing of the, the bird. And uh, so that was one of the reasons uh, it crashed, to get down quick and fast and uh, take care of uh, the guards. Uh, two of the towers, there were three towers, two towers were taken out on the way in by the miniguns on our, uh, the choppers. Uh, one uh, was still standing and that was taken care of as soon as uh, Blue Boy crashed inside the compound. Uh, red wine be uh, became the an assault chopper because of blue uh, green leaf, which had all of the firepower on it. Uh, when we were coming in for landing at the at Sante, a uh, little bit of uh, miscalculations. Uh, another compound was only about 500, 600 meters away from Sante, and when they sat down, they sat. Uh, green leaf set down at that compound. And in retrospect, uh, it was probably one of the best things that happened to the rest of us on the raid because of, uh, uh, at that compound, it was believed that there were other officers from China that were there training the NBA on the SAM sites and things like that. But uh, there was also about 100 to 200 in the estimate. And our ground force was 56. So we didn't, we were out a number there. But the planning that they did and the uh, rehearsals, we had over 170 rehearsals uh, from doing uh, it with all three choppers and then doing it without one of the choppers. The planners estimated that if we lost one chopper, the mission would continue. If we lost two choppers, it would be aborted. Uh, our E and E escape and evasion plan was not very exciting. Uh, Bull Simon said the only way that uh, we would back up to the uh, bend in the river, keep he wanted to keep the, everybody together, and we'd make it as bloody as possible for anybody coming across that stretch of land. And uh, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, we didn't have to. Uh, we didn't have any any plan in use because the choppers came back in and brought us back and safe and sound. But uh, the, the training went on for about three months and we did all kinds of different uh, scenarios where uh, we knew it was some type of rescue mission based on the training, but we didn't know where. At that time, there was uh, planes on the tarmacs that had been hijacked. And we thought, well, maybe we're going over there to release those people. but. Uh, the training uh, was intense, and uh, when we train with live fire, uh, you really start paying attention to what you're doing and which direction you're firing, and the person firing at you. So uh, fortunately, we had no injuries, and uh, no one was 
uh, hurt in the process of the training. We, uh, we, we did uh, a fair amount of uh, example. Uh, they would take some of our 109 that didn't go on the mission. They became very important to us because they helped us train. And they would take them out to a building and they would hide inside the building because according to some psychologists, you know, people would not believe that America is going there to free them and they'd hide from us. So we had guys that would go around and hide and then we had to find them. And then you had another example where somebody may, uh, one of the POWs may have uh, started working with the NBA and the other POWs want to put an end to his life. So you'd had a situation where one POW would be uh, kind of taking a crazy route and the others wanted to kill him. So we had to keep them separated and things like that. So little things like that doesn't seem like that's a big deal, but if in a situation did arise, you need to know how to handle it. And that's, that's what we did. The, the training also from the standpoint of if we lost a chopper, how do you respond? And I can tell you, uh, you know, nobody hates training. Uh, I mean, it's old, it's the same, you know, like I said, we did it over 170 times. So the routine kind of get a little lax in it, but uh, uh, the training that we did and the, the response that we were able to uh, immediately jump into uh, an alternate plan, it flowed just like it was meant to be. There was no hiccups in that respect. Everybody knew they had a, another mission, if you will, and because of the green leaf going down. And when we had that word come across the airwaves to us, it was a little bit more intense because there was 22 guys on that bird and they had a lot more firepower with M60s. And uh, so we became, the red line became the main force of securing the outside buildings and taking care of the guards on the outside. And our main role was Dan Turner, Captain Turner and myself, our objective was to get to the communication building as quickly as possible to eliminate anybody coming in. And you bear in mind, we were you know 23 miles from Hanoi and they estimated 20,000 troops in that area. So- Terry, it might uh, be interesting to hear how you and Captain Dan Turner exited the helicopter and that, those few seconds? Uh, we, um, uh, we were the last two off our bird. And uh, uh, when we landed, uh, Dan, uh, of course, uh, was kind of leading the way off. I was an RTO radio operator to him. And uh, Dan was coming off the bird and uh, one of the NBA with, was firing into our group. And he kind of had Dan in his sights. And uh, uh, fortunately I had him in my sights. And uh, so we eliminated the threat there and moved on and uh, kind of regrouped, got ourselves back in the sink and started towards the clearing the other buildings. We had about three buildings to clear till we could get to the communication building. And the, uh, the Greenleaf pilot that was flying that chopper, when he saw what had happened, looked back around and picked up all the guys on Greenleaf and then brought them back and landed them back at Sante as though they were landing for the first time. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, miscommunications, you might say, but at the same time, we had rehearsed it. We did not rehearse bringing them back in like that. Mm. But, you know, uh, Special Forces guys and most military guys, you have to adapt based on the situation. And that's what we did. So um, once, we, uh, uh, once we were inside the compound, uh, or, or taking care of the inside of the compound, Blue Boy was, uh, Dick Meadows was on a bullhorn talking to through that, telling the people uh, that we anticipated to picking up the POWs that we were Americans, stay down, we're here to take you home. And the, uh, uh, the people on Blue Boy that did their job of eliminating the threats inside the compound did a fantastic job. It was like clockwork to them as well. 
and they took care of the other uh, guard tower and uh, moved on to clearing, looking for POWs. Uh, just about the time that Dan Turner and myself reached the commons here, I heard on the, my, I had a headset on one side of my uh, one, one ear and the other one was opened so Dan and I could communicate. And uh, I heard uh, negative items and items was code word for POWs. And that was the second kind of bad news we had that night. The first one was alternate green. Uh, meaning Greenleaf. At that time, we thought Greenleaf had probably been shot down or had mechanical problems. And we didn't you know, know what to anticipate other than the fact that they weren't with us. So that was the first bad news we had that night. And then negative items was the, the second bad thing that we heard. But uh, with that, they were uh, Bull Simons, uh, by this time had landed back with uh, the Greenleaf group. And he had joined up with uh, Colonel Sidnor, and they were moving towards uh, uh, the compound at that time as well. And he wanted to check, so they did more. Re he made sure that there were no POWs left. And by looking in all the buildings and making sure that they were they were not uh, being hidden or anything like that. So. With that, they called back in the birds and we started up uh, reloading the choppers and heading back to friendly territory. You've explained it very, very clearly, very vividly. Uh, one thing, uh, just to go back a little bit, just in case my listeners sure. don't know, I'm sure many of them would, though. Could you also talk about who exactly the Green Berets are, Special Forces are, and what sort of mission uh, they were designed for? Uh, Special Forces was brought into play by President Kennedy, and uh, he uh, authorized the Green Beret. And Special Forces is, uh, you know, that's our, our uh, the name of our organization in the U.S. Army. There's different groups. Fifth group was in Vietnam. Uh, we have to be in sixth group and seventh group when uh, the people on the raid. Uh, it's, it's a unique group of men uh, that are dedicated to military. And, uh, you know, they, today you have SOCOM, which is uh, the combination of all special ops from Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and all together. Uh, what makes this mission unique, and, and Cliff was talking about, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were in direct control of this mission. In fact, the final word for us to launch the mission came from President Nixon. And uh, uh, so it was uh, kind of high on the totem pole, if you will. And, uh, you know, we were sitting in Takli Air Force Base in Thailand, waiting, uh, not knowing exactly what the mission was yet. Uh, we had not been told what we were going to do. Uh, that happened about uh, an hour before we took off from Tak Lee to go to Udorn to get in on our choppers to fly in Sante. So, you know, we were uh, uh, excited when we heard what the mission was. In fact, uh, the, our orders were to be in the, the auditorium by 1800 hours. Uh, Colonel Sidnor and Bull Simons came in, and uh, there was a big map of North Vietnam. Hanoi had a circle around it, and San Fe had a circle around it. Uh, Colonel uh, Bull Simons told us that tonight, uh, that's where we're going, and we're going there to rescue 60 to maybe 75 POWs, and it was dead silence for four or five seconds, and then it was like the the, the top blew off the cannon. Guys jumped up and were ready to go and we're excited about it. We finally know what our mission is and we're ready to go do, do what we need to do. And uh, uh, it was uh, a very energized group of men. So. Could, could you also mention about who exactly you were facing? What 
what sort of enemy element were you facing at that time? Did the did Intel Intel give you anything on that? No, they didn't. We knew we were facing uh, the bad guys. That that was pretty much it. If they were being held, or our POWs were being held, uh, our job was to uh, neutralize those people and free them. And that was what our mission was. And uh, we did our part. Had they been there, they'd have been home that very night. But uh, unfortunately, uh, as history has uh, explained, they had been moved. They had Camp Faith was uh, where they had taking them to. And if you talk to the POWs, uh, which uh, we've had several reunions over the years, and uh, the first major one was with Ross Perot in San Francisco. And we had a great opportunity of the POWs and the Raiders. We spent the uh, better part of an afternoon together uh, telling, if you will, war stories, but also just uh, reiterating what we did the house, the POWs were so thankful that what we did, even though none of them were taken home, what happened to the POWs and the, the care that they got, the, uh, the, the, you know, there were 13 camps in North Vietnam scattered around, five of those were in, uh, in the capital of Hanoi. The rest of them were scattered around the country in North Vietnam. But uh, the day after Sante Ray, uh, they brought all the POWs together. And I kind of remember some of these guys had been in isolation and solitaire maybe four or five years. So just being with other Americans was uh, uh, a great, great opportunity. Uh, Cliff, you want to jump yeah, in on that? Let me, let me tell uh, a little bit about the intel uh, question that you'd, you'd asked. Um, in special operations, you can kind of make a distinction in two different approaches. One is a reconnaissance team that's heading out into an area to find and learn what is in the area. But a different approach, a different aspect of special operations are those planned missions. And so uh, something like uh, Eagle Claw, which was the attempt to take the hostages from Tehran, or um, the uh, the mission that freed in World War II the uh, the American POWs that were in the Cabanatuan POW camp in the Philippines. These are planned out missions where you've got a picture of what you're going into and you need to execute according to that. And so that's certainly what the Sante raid was. Matter of fact, from that Pentagon planning, uh, as of July 1st, when they got uh, an official brand, um, a, a code word, a uh, name of an operation, and the budgeting and the personnel and the resources committed to it, um, at that point, they went into that basically three-month training period, including the mock-up of the camp that Terry was talking about. And, and sometimes you'll hear the Sante Raid referred to as Operation Kingpin. Operation Ivory Coast or Operation Polar Circle. So in the Pentagon planning phase until July 1st, it was, uh, it was scoped as Operation Polar Circle. And that was all just the planning. Uh, then the second phase, which was all at Eglin Air Force Base, just a little bit south of where I am today. I'm in uh, Southern Alabama and Eglin Air Force Base is down along the Gulf Coast there. Um, that three months was under Operation Ivory Coast, and uh, it was literally only uh, two or three days prior to the launch of the mission that Terry and the 56 Green Berets and some of the, well, the, the helicopter pilots and the A-1 pilots uh, and the MC-130 pilots all were carried over to the theater and arriving that week prior to it, and that portion arriving in Vietnam in Thailand, but then going into Vietnam is called Operation Kingpin. So all of that is a very planned mission. And that's a big part of special operations. That's why the Green Berets were formed. The Green Berets are for those special operations that don't fit under a traditional uh, maneuver that a massive uh, battalion level 
uh, maneuver might require, but instead small, small uh, sized units that can go in very stealthily, get in, get out. And going from there, I know that the the Green Beret Special Forces, you know, they're known for having a lot of great personalities, you know, real storied warriors. Can you talk about some of the personalities um, who are part of this mission, maybe shed some light on some of the, the men who were part of this raid? They are a bunch of characters. Uh, on our training schedule, it was Friday night fights. And... Uh, <laughs> And we had several Friday night fights. But, you know, you guys work hard all week. Uh, we had long hours. But, you know, we started training uh, about dark. And then uh, our day finished when most other people's was starting. And uh, so, you know, and we, security was extremely tight. We came in one day and uh, the choppers uh, let us off. We were walking up to our uh billets and we looked over and there was a couple about three guys standing there taking pictures and about that time two government cars pulled up alongside of them and immediately took their cameras and their film and we you know we had no idea that there was guys watching us that close so it was uh it was pretty pretty interesting and uh we had uh, uh Jake Jakovinko, of all people, is one of the a character. And, uh, but Jake is, uh, these are guys you want on your side. And uh, they're in special forces because they're special. <laughs> and uh, anybody watching this that, that has worked with special ops, special people will know uh, what I'm talking about there. Their, their mission, uh, they take serious, they play hard and work hard. And, uh, uh, that, that I think that pretty well sums it up the type of people they are, but they are dedicated to their country and dedicated to the the mission. And uh, everybody worked hard, and and we really didn't even know what our mission was, but we knew it had something to do with rescue. And just being a part of special ops and special uh, forces, uh, you, you train that way train hard you train uh religiously and you you know that it's going to pay off somewhere down the road and in this case uh it did for us but uh you have pappy kittleson was this was his fourth pow raid he's the only american to be on four pow raids uh he was the youngest on cabanatuan at 19 he was an alamo scout prior to uh, going into special forces. Uh, Alamo Scouts are the precursor to special forces and the OSS. And uh, they uh, did a fantastic job you know, of what they were committed to doing. And then you had uh, uh, our Colonel Sidnor, who at that time was commander of the Ranger uh, School and came over to, to be a part of the Sante Raiders great guy. Uh, General Manor, uh, who was the uh, general, Air Force general in charge, uh, just passed away this year at the ripe age of 100. He turned 100 and a week later he passed away. But uh, just a, a extraordinary uh, individual, a leader, a man that, uh, like, uh, you know, you, you've always said that uh, I'll follow him to hell and back. And that's what it was. Uh, Bill Simons was a man of few words, but uh, when he spoke, uh, he usually had something pretty important. You better listen to it. And uh, he was uh, a, a great man to be around, a good mentor. So uh, Dan Turner, you can't say enough about Dan. Uh, Dan took me under his wing. And uh, before Dan had passed on, I asked him one day, I said, why did you select me? I had no combat experience, and uh, I was, uh, when I first got down there, I was with the advanced team, so I was training, playing guard duty on uh, the building that we had, that they had swept, put Constantino wire around it, and that's where a lot of the planning took place inside that building, and then when I wasn't playing on guard duty, 
as either sleeping or training. So uh, one day Bull Simons came by and I had to let him into the building. And to get into that building, you had to get a field phone. You'd call in somebody from the inside, come out and escort them in, no matter how many times they'd been there or who they were. And uh, while we were waiting for someone to come out to escort Bull Simons in, he asked me how things were going. And I told him, I said, well, I could have stayed at Fort Bragg and pulled all the guard duty I wanted back there. I said, I came here to be on a, a mission, I thought. And uh, Bull uh, didn't, it was, like I said, he's made a few words. He just kind of looked at me and said, you just hang in there. Things are going to change. And about a week and a half later, uh, they made the first cut. And I was uh, selected to be on the red wine as the RTO for Dan Turner. So I felt very fortunate to be a part of that. And uh, a lot of it was because of Dan Turner had faith in me. And uh, the fact that he said, he said, you know, whatever he asked me, I did it. I gave him no bullshit back, just went and did it and did it with a smile on my face. So uh, that's, and, 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 you know, in our book, there are, are several life lessons that uh, I think uh, apply to daily lives of our each individual. So life lesson one was sense of humor and uh, always be prepared. So fantastic. Um, going on from there, I, we, you know, we talked about the raid. We talked about um, your experience in the raid and, and you described it very vividly. Um, one thing I want to talk about is sort of the aftermath of the raid and the reaction from, you know, all sides, the, the reaction of the United States, the reaction from POWs, and even on the enemy side, the North Vietnamese, was that, do we know of their reaction to the raid? What was the aftermath, really? Coming home, all of the Green Berets, all of the Air Force assets involved, everybody who knew that it had happened felt this terrible sense of disappointment um, and that they had let down the POWs. But unknown to them for the next two years until the POWs came home, none of them knew that actually the raid had had the dramatic change a turn 180 degree turnaround for all the POWs because of this. Terry mentioned it earlier that the day after um, the raid, all the POWs uh, were brought, it was actually within two days and we have an accounting that is just a couple of days afterward given by the POWs. The organization is called NAM POW. So the POWs who uh, came home, had this association, and they will tell you, and some of them uh, are in our book telling the dramatic effect, that they were all of a sudden pulled out of these outskirts, no longer at these eight POW camps that are out in the boonies. Um, they were instead consolidated into the heart of Hanoi. And you might think, oh no, they're having to go back to the Hanoi Hilton. Actually, that was the greatest thing because suddenly instead of isolation that they had been in for you know some of them literally the, they'd been in solitary confinement for a year never hearing an american voice for years some of them all of a sudden they were all in the rooms together they were put into four large cells that could each hold about you know 50 pow's and so in those cells they easily uh, caught up, talked to each other, encouraged each other, also nursed their wounds. Some of them had, you know, broken bones that had never been set. Some of them had, uh, you know, terrible torture uh, scars that needed tending. And so um, there had always been a senior ranking officer. There had always been the attempt to make a structure, a military structure, and even in these, you know, outposts that are, you know, in the boondocks, but now they all literally are in the same rooms. They can easily organize into a military unit. And so they created on their own, the POWs did, the fourth 
PO, uh, fourth allied POW wing. And that includes, you know, people who are famous like uh, Jeremiah Denton, uh, who ends up becoming a senator here in Alabama, uh, John McCain, the senator from Arizona. So these are all those POWs that you've heard of, they suddenly are all together. And you can imagine they loved the fact that they could organize morale shot up. They were able to have church services because uh, they were allowed to, you know, uh, the, the um, captors, the North Vietnamese did not like it, but, but they would sing. They organized. Uh, and so you can imagine their world changed. It's almost like a secret world that nobody outside of their POW camp knew but their world had changed and their morale shot up. Um, also, now some of the political fallout. Uh, within the first week of December, uh, so about a week after the raid, there was already uh, hearings in the Senate. And it was definitely used as a political ploy and tool. Uh, to score points. And two of the worst were Senators Fulbright and Gore. And in their hearings, they tried to portray, especially just to be cruel to the administration and not caring that they were also insulting our military and those who had had this noble calling to go on this raid. Um, they were basically saying that um, that our intelligence failure should have told any reasonable commander not to authorize the launch of this raid. And instead, and I thought that Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird does a good job explaining this. He said, the intelligence was strong to say that there was activity at the Sante POW camp, even in the week prior there was a limitation to how many uh, flights you could do, because you can imagine the more flights you put, you're creating an X showing exactly what the target is. So you only have certain level of intel of visibility. The human is very sketchy. As a matter of fact, the uh, only indication that there were now no POWs at the Sante POW camp was on the Thursday prior. And this is the day before the launch happens on Friday night, November 20th. And uh, the actual POW camp uh, uh, infiltration happens at 2 a.m. on the 21st, Saturday, the 21st of November. So that Thursday, there was an intelligence, a human bit of uh, intel that was simply a cigarette box that had a listing of POW camps. And on that, Sante was not on that. So to imagine that someone could have interpreted that as there are definitively no longer any POWs at Sante, that's ludicrous. And yet that's the picture that Gore, and Fulbright painted in front of the world media to say that anybody would have seen that there were not any POWs at Sante. So instead, the President Nixon was very noble in this. And I'll tell you, Nixon, of course, uh, gets a, a bad rap. But in this case, he was so noble as to, after things did not go the way he had uh, hoped, um, he still stood by the men of the raid and the and committed that if given a similar choice with similar intel, he's going to try again. He honored the men of the raid that week. And one of Terry's friends, Tyrone Adderley, uh, was actually in the East Room. Uh, tell, as a matter of fact, Terry, you'll have to tell us a little bit about, about Adderley. But uh, I met Adderley at, at the reunion this past November in, in Arizona. And uh, he's just a, a great guy, great storyteller. And uh, he receives his medal from the president in the East Room of the White House uh, on the 25th of November, just days afterward. 
And it's just, it, it's it, admirable that Nixon stood up and took responsibility and said, we made the right call. It was uh, something that I'd do again, given this opportunity. Terry, can you tell us a little bit about Adderley? Tyrone was a, uh, he, 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 we bunked in the old tile style billets where you just had big open bay and Tyrone was right next to me. And his wife, Gloria, uh, used to send him uh, letters. And these letters uh, had a great scent about them. Uh, she sprayed them with perfume and stuff. So I would, uh, I would hijack those letters and put them under my pillow. <laughs> And Tyrone wouldn't get his letters. He, he knew he had mail, but he didn't know where it was. <laughs> and uh, so we had a lot of fun doing things like that with one another. But Tyrone's a great guy. And, uh, you know, I, you know, the guys on the raid, I, I can't say anything bad about any of them. They were, they gave their heart and their soul like a good SF guy would do. Terry, can and, I mention that... Uh, I happen to know from uh, hearing your stories and his story um, that uh, Tyrone was a, a uh, M79, which is a grenade launcher. And right. also as a convoy was approaching from the south on the main road that's to and alongside the Sante POW camp, he was in a small group, I think only three, including Tyrone. Right. Um, and they launched a, a law, a light anti-tank weapon on that and fended off that approaching uh, reinforcements. Yep, That's, uh, that was part of the uh, one thing I didn't mention. We had A1Es flying cover for us. And at any one time, they were flying a figure eight. Uh, so we had a, an A1E, which is, you know, uh, not, I'm not an Air Force guy, but uh, that's the old World War II jam, prop jobs. Also and called Sky Raider. They flew low, and yeah, and and uh, so we had good cover. We were going to blow the bridge uh, coming across from uh, Hanoi. Unfortunately, because of the uh, uh, problem with we had, we had to uh, with Greenleaf uh, landing at the wrong place. We had to forego that. But the A1 East uh, kept watch, and if anybody was going to cross that bridge, they had uh, the orders were to uh, neutralize anything coming across that bridge. So we were protected in good shape. And, uh, and of course, Tyrone does his part to help that as well. So teamwork is what it boiled down to. That, that's great stuff. Uh, I'm just curious, maybe we don't know. Uh, maybe there is no evidence of it, but do we know sort of the reaction uh, by the North Vietnamese? I, am I, I, mean, I can't imagine that they didn't get a little shook up at the idea that the U.S. can literally reach out and touch them almost anywhere. Of course, you know, thousands of Hanoi residents, uh, maybe millions, uh, saw the big raid. There were, of course, the, the aircraft that were at the Sante POW camp, but about an hour and 20 minutes prior to arriving at the Sante POW camp, um, there was a Navy diversionary raid. 59 aircraft launched from the uh, USS Ariskany and the USS Range or Hancock. Um, those aircraft were only a diversion. They never actually dropped bombs. What they dropped was flares and they were over Haiphong, which is to the east. So all of the Air Defense Command focused their radars to the east and it worked like clockwork because the raiders including terry on the helicopters came in very low 500 feet and uh, arrived without ever getting picked up by radar um, there were sams around the sante pow camp seven of them identified and mm -hmm. they uh, never launched against those aircraft instead it was just the high-flying fighters that were for mig cap and our F-105s, the SAM killers. So all of Hanoi knew it had happened. So it was going to be in the press the next day. But coincidentally, uh, there was also a maneuver down in, around the DMZ somewhere in uh, southern Laos and, uh, and in North, Viet I mean, in South Vietnam, that the North Vietnamese thought 
that is a combined effort, like, you know, two pronged approach, and it wasn't at all. And so the story of them uh, kind of all got muddled. In other words, they did not know that it was for getting a POW camp. It took a few days before that lodged in their minds and that they saw what was being finally reported by the Defense Department, uh, Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird, very explicitly showed Sante, the POW camp, the effects, the benefits, the, the intentions. Um, and then of course, you know, it was, it was so broadly understood there. Um, the North Vietnamese were embarrassed so at first their story was there was this attack and they fended it off. But instead, the, when it becomes obvious that they absolutely walked in to the POW camp cells with impunity and not a single raider was lost, not even uh, any of the fighters overhead, 59 Navy aircraft, 57 Air, Air Force aircraft, and nothing, not a single uh, serviceman was lost. That is in, I mean, basically in the backyard of Hanoi, they're scared to death. And you could tell that they were rattled, um, sort of uh, embarrassed. And uh, then we also, one last thing, we have uh, memoirs that are coming out in these recent decades. So 30 and 50 years afterwards, you're getting some, you know, stories told by commanders uh, who were there at the time. And you can tell when you piece those together that they were absolutely clueless and surprised and embarrassed uh, in their commander's conversations as it went up the chain. How could we allow this to happen? Because it basically America was able, these special operators were able to operate, get in, get out with impunity. It was, it was fantastic. And then, of course, we've also talked about the great effect it had on the POWs themselves. We, we basically owned that little plot of land for 30 minutes. Today, the Sante Raid is studied at uh, military academies around the world, not just in America. Like, for instance, I went to the Air Force Academy, graduated in 88, and I knew about the Sante Raid from that. It wasn't until after that that it started to dawn on me what my father's involvement was in it. He always had sort of told stories and war stories kinds of things. But now I understood, wow, my dad was on the Sante Raid. Um, Admiral William McRaven, who is famous on YouTube in these past, say, three years, five years, um, he was the commander of, of uh, U U.S. Special Operations Command. He's a Navy SEAL himself. Uh, he was now that pinnacle that was created in 1987 is when the U.S. Special Operations Command was created. William McRaven wrote a textbook as an, just as an example to you of how it's taught. And his textbook uses uh, takes only 10 case studies of how special ops principles of special ops. And it's used around the world. And one of those 10 is the Sante Raid. And let me mention one other thing. Uh, Terry lives near Fort Leavenworth, where the Command General Staff College is. There, they teach the Sante Raid. Uh, we're in contact with uh, a group in Poland. Uh, Poland has a special connection because their ambassador was one of the, you know, people talking of negotiating with the North Vietnamese anyway. But people in Poland honor the Sante Raid. It's neat to have them in conversation with us this past year. In England, there's... Uh, reenactment groups that have had re recreations of the Sante POW camp. And uh, so it's one of those things that there are few, so, uh, few missions so well planned and executed as to be a, an example for how special operations should, op should work. If you look at the uh, array to get bin Laden, uh, you can pretty much draw the same uh, figures of how Sante was done and Obama was done the same way. Yeah, they just had a little like, bit better. Uh, that's a good point about the bin Laden raid. A helicopter goes into and lands in a crash land because it's just going to be that tight. But it goes in, they spill out with seconds only to make sure that, you know, that they get their target. And, uh, 
it it really is there's it is a textbook example of how it should work the technology uh, has really changed when you look at uh, bin laden and you know one of the things that uh, is always interesting in fact uh, this this coming november we'll have our we're going to celebrate our 50th even though it's 51 and uh, the seventh group is uh, going to be uh, showing us some of their new techniques and toys that they use that uh, we would have killed for. Uh, our most exciting, I mean, our uh, the, the goggles we used were World War II ski goggles, and uh, you had amber or white. <laughs> and uh, bringing the single point laser into play was a big benefit for us and uh, really marked how technology has improved the, the war game here we're only scratching the surface you know <laughs> unfortunately we're reaching about that time but before i let you guys go can you talk a little bit more about the book if you have it could you just hold it up for our viewers and and talk a little bit about what went into the book and how people can get the book and learn more who will go into the sante pow camp and uh it was a labor of love Terry had been building the stories, uh, the details, the research for uh, a number of years prior, since about what, 2012? Is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. right. And then when we compiled it and Terry using it, Terry is beloved among not only the Sante Raid Association, but also the Special Forces Association. And people really entrusted their stories to Terry. And uh, Terry and I worked to try to knit them together into a, a storyline that, that builds and that people can sort of follow as opposed to a textbook, you know. And so it really ends up being a, a, a contribution to uh, educating people on what the Sante Raid is, not as a, a stodgy um, history book, but as a, a personal story that Terry shares a lot of, a lot of humor in it, a lot of sincere um, uh, lessons, life lessons to pass on to next generation. And a, of course, a love for America and all that America's uh, heritage uh, blesses us with today. And Colonel Donlin wrote the forward to it. Roger Donlin. Colonel Roger Medal Donlin was the first medal. Yeah. He was the first medal of honor winner in Vietnam. And, right. and Terry, he's a friend of Terry's there in the Kansas City area. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I know we had some technical difficulties, but you know, <laughs> I'm glad we were able to get through it and, and get this done. I really appreciate it. Um, yep. you know, I hope we can do this again sometime and uh, you know, <laughs> and get and more of the story out. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Yes. Take care.